وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد This is our second day for the intensive Dawrah explaining the chapter of fasting from the great kitab Umdatul Ahkam written by the author Abdul Ghani ibn Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi rahimahullah This hadith that the author rahimahullah brought, it talks about the ruling of fasting whilst traveling. And the wording that the author rahimahullah chose here is the wording of Bukhari. This is the wording of Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah. Aisha said أن حمزة ابن عمر الأسلمي that حمزة ابن عمر الأسلمي he said to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم أأصوم أأصوم should I fast um, في السفر whilst traveling here the question is أأصوم shall I fast there is no narration that points out what type of fasting he's asking. Is it obligatory? Is it voluntary? It's not stated. He says, أَأَصُومُ shall I fast في السفر? Shall I fast when I'm traveling? Some of the scholars, they said, there is a slight indication within the narration that tells us it's not an obligatory fasting. Because they said, وَكَانَ كَثِيرَ الصِّيَامِ He used to fast a lot. Okay, that's voluntary. وَكَانَ كَثِيرَ الصِّيَامِ means um, he used to fast a lot. That kind of indicates, they said, that it might be um, a voluntary fasting. There's a wording in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet Sallallahu he said, هِيَ رُخْصَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ the, he, the question he asked is, can I fast when I'm traveling? And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, it's a rukhsa. Traveling is a rukhsa. It's an easy option for you to break your fast when you are traveling. And rukhsa is used to something which is obligatory. These two are kind of competing here. One of the wordings in the narration indicates this, and another wording indicates that. So is it obligatory? Or is it, or is it voluntary? Inshallah Ta'ala will say, it can carry both, no problem. The messenger said to him, in shi'ta fasum, if you want to fast, where in shi'ta fa'aftir, and if you want, you can break your fast. The benefits that we take from the hadith is as follows. Number one, the person who is traveling, lahu an yasuma, it is allowed, the one who is traveling, it is permissible for him to fast. And it's also permissible for him to break his fast. He's allowed to. Um, which one is more better for the traveler? Is it better for him to break his fast? Or is it better for him to fast? We know he can if he wants to. And we know he can leave it if he wants to. We know he can do if he wants, he can fast, and if he wants, he can break, break his fast. But the question here is, 
which one is best for him? What's the best option for him? We'll say that the best, the best option for him is whatever is easiest for him. If whilst traveling, if the person whilst traveling, fasting is more easier for him, then that's best for him. And if not fasting is easier for him, then that's best according to the Sharia. The question here is, which is better? Shall I fast if I'm traveling? Is it better to fast or is it better for me to break my fast? We'll say it's all depending on you. Which one is easiest for you? Whichever is easiest for you is the best one. What is the after for the traveler? It's what's easiest for him. Ah, it's a rukhsa. Rukhsa means it revolves around simplicity and ease. Sharia just wants to bring about ease. It wants to help you, wants to serve you, wants to take care of you. So whatever is easy for you is what the Sharia likes. That's what the Prophet said in the hadith when the man asked, he said, shall I fast when I'm traveling? The Prophet didn't say, originally it's best to fast, uh, break your fast, or originally it's... No, he didn't say that. He said, if you want, break your fast, and if you want, fast. Whichever is easiest for you. Whichever is easiest for you. Because it's a rukhsa. The second benefit that we take from the hadith is, the person should ask a question in things that he may have no knowledge of. If you don't have knowledge of an aspect in the religion, then ask the people of knowledge. Ask those who know. And it's never embarrassing to ask a question. These were the companions. These were noble people. And even then they were asking the Messenger والسلام, about everything that they needed to know. The third benefit that we take from this hadith is how the companions, they strived in attaining knowledge and understanding of the religion so that they can worship Allah based on insights. <coughs> Sahabas, they will strive to gain knowledge and understanding of the deen. Why? Because they wanted to worship Allah with insights. That's very important. <coughs> Some people, their culture is for them what's right and what's wrong. So, yeah, we, we do this. We've been doing this all our lives. That's not evidence and that's not religion. And that's not knowledge. Knowledge is what Allah and His Messenger said. As Ibn al-Qayyim said, Al-ilmu qala Allahu qala al-rasoolu qala al-sahabatu hum dawil irfani. Ma al-ilmu nasbaka lil khilafi safahatan bayna al-rasool wa bayna ra'ya faqihin. That knowledge is qala Allah qala al-rasool qala al-sahaba. That's what knowledge is. So if you want to worship Allah with insight, and you really want to be, your heart, you want to find tranquility, then what do you do? Then, what do you call it? Learn and gain knowledge of the religion. Number four, the benefit that we take from this hadith is, the person who fasts whilst traveling, that his fasting is correct. His fasting is valid. If you're traveling and you fast, your fasting is valid. Some of you might think, why are we bringing that point up? You'll see soon, inshallah ta'ala. You'll see soon why we're bringing that argument up. Huh? The ruqsa is what's easiest for you, right? The reason why the ruqsa was given to you is what's easiest for you. Sometimes, for me, for example, it's easier to fast with the people than to fast by myself sometime in the year. Me personally. I don't find it hard when people are fasting with me. Are we all together? So that's easiest for me, so I will do that. But another person, traveling, picking up his bag, running down the uh, one gate to the other and checking in and going through, through security and taking out his wallet and that for him is stressing out. And the so break your fast. Naam. The fifth benefit that we take from the hadith is the person who's asking a question, the one who's asking the question, the one who's inquiring about something should present his situation to the one who he's asking the question to. So the scholar and whoever it is, psychologist, whatever you're talking to, present your situation to the person you're asking the question from. You the questioner, Present your situation 
to the person you are questioning. Don't hide anything. Tell them everything that they need to know. Why? لِيَكُونَ السُّؤَالِ مُطَابِقًا So that the question that you ask him, أَلَمَ لِيَكُونَ الْجَوَابُ So that the answer can be مُطَابِقًا لِلسُّؤَالِ It can be in accordance to your question. The more you give the person insight of the question, and the more you present the issue to them in more clarity, the more the answer is going to be accurate. The more it's going to be accurate. The sixth benefit that we take from the hadith is Yusru Shari'ati al-Islamiya. Our religion is a religion of ease, simplicity. It's not here to torture you. It's not here to bully you. It's not here to burden you and oppress you. It's here to serve you. It's here to take care of you. And this brings us to a very important issue, which is the relationship between the legislation and the human essence. Your creation. The one who created you will legislate in accordance to that creation. That's very important and that is what many Muslims and even many groups don't tend to understand. That the Sharia is always going to be in line with your khalq. Are we all together? Am I making sense here? Meaning, for example, groups like feminists. Feminists, look at their, their arguments and the way they look at life. What is the problem they have? They're fighting with their essence. You know, they don't even allow you to say history. You don't know why. You know why they don't allow you to say history? Because it's his story. History is his story, right? They don't like you. <laughs> they don't like you saying that. Nothing. They want everything to be the same. They're fighting with the khalq, the way Allah created them, Subhanahu wa Taala. That Allah made them genders. Are we all together? And remember. Men have a rulings that are befitting for them. As women have rulings that are befitting for them. Tailored made for them. By who? The creator the heavens of the earth. Are we all together? So whenever you see a people who fight against Allah's legislations, they tend to also go against the way Allah created them. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. You always find that correlation. When Adam ate from the tree, what happened to him? It affected his creation, the way Allah created him. His aura showed. Because he went against the legislation, which then affected the, his khalq, the way he appeared, the way he was. Are we all together, brothers? Allah says about shaitan, what did he say? وَلَا آمُرَنَّهُ فَلَا يُبَتِّكُنَّ آذَانَ الْأَنْعَانِمِ وَلَا آمُرَنَّهُ فَلَا يُغَيِّرُنَّ قَلْقَ وَمَنْ يَتَّخِذِ الشَّيْطَانَ وَلِيًّا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ خَسِرَ خُسْرَانًا مُبِينًا يَعِدُهُمْ وَيُمَنِّيهِمْ وَمَا يَعِدُهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا He wants you to change the way that you are. Why does shaitan want us to... Why does shaitan want us not to prostrate to Allah Azza wa Jalla and pray to Allah? Because that raises us. That's a station that raises us. Shaitan is against your essence because it's your essence that took him out of Jannah. Adam was put higher than him. So he loves to see a drunk Muslim falling around on the floor, sleeping inside his vomit. Because this was who he was told once upon a time to prostrate to his essence. That brings joy to him. He loves to see that same human being fulfilling his desires and just eating and doing as he wishes. Because it humiliates him and that's what brings joy to him. The Sharia here is to serve you. It is here to what? Serve you. Last but not least, the seventh benefit that we take from the hadith is إِثْبَاتُ الْمَشِيَةِ لِلْعَبْدِ The slave has a choice. Free will. You have a choice. And this hadith refutes the group of uh, the group that claim that the slave doesn't have no choice. That he is like a leaf on a windy day. They say that the humans are like a leaf on a windy day. The leaf cannot control itself. The wind is what controls it. They are saying that the humans are like that. We have no choice. But this hadith said, it said, in shi'ta fasum, if you want to, fast. And if you want, break your fast. You have a choice. You can do what you want. Now.
This hadith, Anas ibn Malik, he said, Kunna nusafiru, we were travelers. Kunna nusafiru. It doesn't mean that we were travelers and we was always travelers. The word kunna doesn't mean, it doesn't, la yakhtadil mudawama. It doesn't show continuation and consistency and it happened a lot. As, as can sometimes be benefit from the word kana. Kana in the Arabic language, it does show ad dawam wal istimrar. It shows continuation of something and keep, the keep, that it keeps reoccurring. That's not the case here right now. Okay? Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ, him traveling in Ramadan, it didn't happen many. Okay? So, kind of doesn't benefit the meaning. Kunna nusafiru, we used to, we travel, sorry. Ma'an Nabi with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Falam ya'i bis sa'imu. The Messenger, he did not um, blame or he did not tell off the one who was fasting. Alal muftiri over the one who was breaking his fast. Walal muftiru ala sa'imi. And he didn't tell off and scold the ones who were, who were not fasting over the ones who were fasting. He didn't tell anyone off basically. He didn't say to the ones who were fasting, why are you fasting for? And he didn't say to the ones who weren't fasting, why are you not fasting as well? He didn't, alayhi salatu. This wording is the wording of Imam al Bukhari. It's Imam al Bukhari's wording. The benefits that we take from this hadith. Number one, the permissibility of fasting when you're traveling. And also, breaking your fast when you're traveling. Why? Because the messenger, he consented to both of the parties. He allowed them to do what they want. He looked at them and their situation and he didn't tell anyone off. That means you can fast if you want to. You can also not fast if you want to. It's your choice. So when two people are traveling and one doesn't fast and the other one fast, don't blame. Don't criticize. Because the messenger didn't, alayhi salatu wasalam. Don't say, I'm better than you, mashallah. Why are you not? Just fast. and Don't tell the person off. And the person who is more righteous than you and more fearful of Allah, azza wa jalla, Nabi Allah, Muhammad, he didn't tell anyone off. So the person, is, it's his choice. He can do what he wishes. Number two, the messenger's consent is a proof in our religion. Whatever the messenger consents to. You know what consent means? Anything that is done in his presence and he doesn't object. He does not object. He allows it to happen. This is a proof in our religion. I mean, we can use that as an argument and say, this is permissible. Why? Because it was done in the presence of the messenger and he did not object to it. Because if it was wrong, he would object to it. His whole purpose in being amongst his companions was to correct their mistakes. That was his job, alayhi salatu, alayhi salatu wasalam. And so since he didn't object to it, it's permissible. And we always mention this principle which is, that it is not permissible for the messenger to delay in explaining something when the need is there. If this action was wrong, he would have to explain it on the spot and say it's wrong. But because he didn't, it shows that it's what? It's permissible. What both parties did is permissible. The third benefit that we take from the hadith is this hadith is a refutation against the al-zahiriyyah, the zahiri madhab. There's a madhab called madhab al-zahiriyyah, which originated from Abu Dawood al-zahiri, but then it was supported and it was aided by Ibn Hazm rahimahullah ta'ala. Their argument was, when you're a traveler, you can't fast. And if you do fast, you're fasting Will not be, you will not be rewarded for your fasting. It's null and void. And the argument was the statement of Allah, which is, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ The argument is, whichever from amongst you is ill or is a traveler, then he brings back his fasting other days. They said, look, he brings back his fasting other days. Meaning, if you're sick or you're a traveler, you are not allowed to fast. You have to bring it back another time. That's what they took from the ayah. Are we all together, brothers? 
That's what we, they took from the ayah. Like in what we said is, the reconciliation between the ayah and the hadith is, you bring it back as a rukhsa. As a rukhsa. Not that if you do choose to fast, that your fasting is incorrect. That's incorrect position to hold. Number four, the fourth benefit that we take from it again is Yusru Shari'at al Islamiyah, how simple our religion is and how we were given a choice between fasting and breaking our fast. Naam. This hadith is the wording of an Imam Muslim. This is the wording of an Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala. Bukhari narrated it, but this is the wording of Muslim. Okay? What does it say for you? No, this is the wording of Muslim. Does it say the wording of Bukhari on there for you? Can I see it? I'm sure that it's Muslim. I hold my grounds. Muslim. The book is wrong. I checked it last night. I'm still saying it's Muslim. Um, Abu Darda, he said, ma'a We went with the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Kharajna here means from Medina. Traveling to where? In the month of Ramadan. We were traveling in the month of Ramadan. Ibn Mulaqin, who I mentioned yesterday, he has an explanation on Umdatul Ahkam. His kitab is called Al Ilam Bi Fawaid Umdatul Ahkam. He mentions that this journey was the Battle of Badr. What battle was it? Ghazwatul Badr. That's the battle it was. Ibn Hajar didn't allow that, Rahimahullah. He did not accept that in uh, Fatul Bari. Lakin, Ibn Mulaqin seems stronger. We went out with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi shahri Ramadan in the month of Ramadan. Fi harrin shadidin and it was very hot. The weather was very, very hot. And one of us hatta in kana ahaduna la yadu yadahu ala rasihi min shiddati al harri. That one of us would place his hand on his head because of the heat. Too hot. صائمون, and there was no one fasting amongst us illa Rasulullah except the Messenger of Allah. Wa Abdullah ibn Rawaha. And Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Rawaha. What is the benefits that we take from the hadith? Three benefits. Number one, the permissibility of fast, uh, breaking your fast when traveling in Ramadan. Because the companions with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi the ones that were with the Messenger, they were not fasting. They were not fasting. The only one, two who were fasting was what? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and who? Abdullah ibn Rawaha. And Abdullah ibn Rawaha was killed in the battle of Mu'ta. He was killed in what battle? He was the three, from the three people that the Messenger selected and chose. Does anyone know who the three people were? Ja'far. Ja'far, you good. Second? Zayd ibn Harith, and third was what? Abdullah ibn Rawaha. And then when the messenger said, if, you, if they three die, you guys pick whoever you want. And who did they pick? 
Khalid ibn Walid. He brought the army back home. They were fighting with the Romans and he brought the army safe and sound home. He made a whole smoke and dust in the air and he took his companions out of the battle and he brought them home because he knew that the fight could not work. He was not in the favor of the Muslims. Are we all together? That's where the Messenger وسلم, lost his own cousin, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, Ali's brother. He died in that battle. All three of them died. And the only person who didn't die was from the leaders, was Khalid ibn Walid. Khalid, I think that day he broke nine swords in that battle. He snapped nine swords, something like that. Sayfullah, the sword of Allah. Sayfullah al Maslul. Khalid ibn Walid. Jawazu, the permissibility of breaking your fast whilst traveling in Ramadan. Because the Sahabas were not fasting when the Prophet were, were they? They weren't. Only Abdullah ibn Rawaha and the Messenger were, not, were, were, were fasting. Second benefit. The best of the fasting, the be, sorry, the, the best of the two, whether to fast or not to fast, the scholars who said it is better to fast, this is the hadith they used. The scholars that said that it's better to fast, they use this hadith. Why? I mean, as, as long as it's not hardship on you, they said because of the Prophet's action, the Messenger will always choose what was best. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they also said the second reason why we believe that the fasting is better is because fi in, in it is asra'u fi ibra'i dhimmatihi. The fasting, it gets rid of the obligation quicker. Whereas if you don't fast, you're going into, into debt. You're going into debt. Okay. So you have to bring back the fast if you don't uh, fast for travel. Oh, of course you have to bring it back. If you break your fast due to traveling, we mentioned in the ayah, or ala min It's going to bring it back another time. Oh, you have to bring it back. So they said, this is our argument. Look at it. The messenger did it. Are we all together? The third benefit that we take from the hadith is the religion is not about majority. The religion is not about majority said this. Because the Messenger وسلم, and Abdullah ibn Rawaha they didn't follow the majority. And I haven't seen anyone pick that up from this hadith. No explanation pointed that out. I was the, I thought I thought that was a point to bring out. And we know that the majority isn't necessarily the truth. Allah said in the Quran, Wa in man fil ardi an If you follow the majority of the people, they will misguide you from the straight path. Allah says, Rather the majority of the people don't know. Allah says in another ayah, Little from my slaves show gratitude. The ones that show gratitude are little. So many people, the majority for them is the haqq. If the overwhelming majority do something, it's the truth. That's how it should be. No, not necessarily. And that doesn't also mean that the majority can't sometimes be right. They can. Are we all together, brothers? But the majority isn't the scaling and the way to determine what is right from what is wrong. The fourth benefit that we take from this hadith is taking precautions. Taking precautions and coming with means to push away harm from yourself. Taking the precautions and the means to push away harm from yourself does not go against tawakkul. It doesn't go against tawakkul. Where do we get that from the hadith? These sahabas didn't fast for what reason? Because they were scared that it might cause them hard and pain and they might not be able to physically endure the hardship that comes with with traveling and fasting. Sahih. So they took the means 
to stop this harm coming to them. Can we then say that they didn't come with tawakkul? Huh? No. Coming with the means, pushing away from yourself harm, doesn't mean that you didn't come with tawakkul. Rather, tawakkul comes after you've come with the means and then you rely on Allah Azza wa Jalla. You all know the famous hadith of the man who came to the messenger and he said, Ya Rasulullah, shall I tie my camel and rely on Allah? Or shall I let it go and I rely on Allah? The messenger said, tie your camel and then rely on Allah. Are we all together? When Maryama bint Imran, the mother of Isa ibn Maryam, his mother was giving birth and she was under the tree. And Allah told her, Shake the tree from the bottom and then the fruit will fall down for you. Her coming with that means, does it go against the tawakkul? Does it go against tawakkul? No, it doesn't go against tawakkul. Tawakkul means reliance on Allah Azza wa Jalla. It doesn't go against it. Rather, Allah told her to do that. He said, push the tree from the bottom, then the fruit will come down for you, and then you rely on Allah. After she's pushed the tree, whether those fruits are going to come down, it's in whose hands? That's when you rely on Allah. You come with the results, uh, sorry, sorry, you come with the means and you leave the results with Allah Azza wa Jalla. So. Jabir ibn Abdullah is a companion and his father is a companion. He narrated from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Kana Rasulullah, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was fi safarin in a journey. What journey was this? The scholars, they said it was Ghazwatul Fath, which happened on the eighth year of the Hijriya. Because another riwayah mentioned it. Another wording by Imam Muslim mentioned it. This hadith that the author brought here is the wording of Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala. Lafd here is Lafd al-Bukhari. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في سفر The messenger was in the غزوة الفتح The expedition of الفتح So the traveling here was الفتح And it happened when? Um, it was in Ramadan Ramadan, what year was it? سنة ثمانين On the eighth year of the Hijriya فرأى زحاما The messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم He saw Ziham. Ziham means uh, a crowd. The messenger saw a crowd, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A group of people in a particular place. Wara'a rajulan, the messenger said, saw a man qad dhullila. And he, they were, they were, what would be the light, and what would be the correct word to say? Qad dhullila. They shaded him now. They placed a shade over him from the sun. فقال, the messenger said, ما هذا, What is this? What does he mean? ما هذا? He means, ما شأن هذا الرجل? What's the affairs of this man? What's this man's story? Meaning, referring to who? The one that was shaded. قالوا, they said, صائمون. He was he's a fasting man. He's fasting. And in other words, the fasting has made him become like this. He's become so weak, he can't even move. So they're shading him. The messenger then said, Laysa min al birri, it is not from righteousness and it's not from good. As sawmu fi safari, to fast whilst traveling. A couple of things that are mentioned in the hadith. First of all, this hadith. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa he saw a group of people. Okay, he saw a group of people crowded somewhere and he walked towards the crowd. And the Messenger, he asked, 
He said, ما هذا? What is this? And I want to mention, brothers, when you see something, ask. Before you give a verdict, before you pass a ruling, before you say something, find out first, what is it? Ask. Question. The Messiah said, ما هذا الرجل? What's this man's story? What is, who's this man? عليه الصلاة والسلام. ما هذا الرجل? And this was very common when it came to the messenger. He would gather information before he passed a ruling. As much information as he could. And then he would pass a ruling. You all know the famous hadith where the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he entered the masjid and he saw a rope tied to two pillars in the masjid. It's a rope. And the rope was tied on two pillars of the masjid. And the messenger said, whose rope is this? And what is this rope for? And they said to him, Ya Rasulullah, your wife, Zainab bint Jahsh, your wife, she prays. Qiyamul Layl. She prays and she prays and she prays. And her legs become tired from the, the length of her standing. She stands for too long. That she no longer can stand on her legs, so she grabs onto the rope. She holds on to it so she can pray. She wants to pray even more. Her legs can't hold her. So first of all, he said, what is this rope? They said, it's owned by Zainab. He said, what does Zainab do with it? They said, Ya Rasulullah, she prays and she holds on to it. Look how he asked questions first. Now he realized what's taking place. He found out. He then said, Huluhu, take it down. Take this rope down. And then the messenger, he said, Every one of you should pray in accordance to his ability. You're not allowed to burden yourself like that. That your legs cannot carry you. You can't do it anymore. But you're going to do it and push yourself that much. Allah doesn't want that. He said, take the rope down. We're all together, brothers. So it's very important that before you say something, ask, why do you do this? Okay. What made you do it? Okay. What was the purpose behind it? Okay. Gather information. And then when you answer, you're going to be fair in your answer. You're going to be fair in your, in your verdict. But we hasten, many of us, including myself, we hasten to pass the fatwa or the verdict or the answer to something without knowing it very well. And majority of the times, because of that, we pass an unfair judgment. We pass a what? We pass an unfair judgment on someone. We haven't perceived this situation properly. And the Messenger والسلام, was never like that. He would go to the person and ask them, What made you do this? Were you, and it's going to come to us later, that he asked Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As a question, What made you do this? Amma, was, is this true what's being said about you? He verified. That's very important. And if you look at that prophetic guidance, it will actually save us from a lot of disunity and problems that we have amongst ourselves. Wallah. A lot of khilafat. If you listen to both parties, just say one thing to both parties. Did you talk to the other person? He'll say to you. No, but he already knows. But he already knows. Did you tell him what you're telling me now? But why do I need to? It's clear. Everyone knows. No, did you tell him? You find out? He's using all of these smoke screens of saying he knows. It's clear. No, you didn't tell him and it was important for you to go and tell him. That's what the Prophet ﷺ's way was. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So these hadith, brothers, it shouldn't just be a it shouldn't just be a hadith that we listen to and we're amazed with it, but it should impact our life and the way we conduct ourselves. So the messenger said, Mahada, what is this? Qalu they said, Sa'imun, it's a fasting man. And then the Prophet said, Laysa min al birri. It is not from righteousness. as fi safari To what? To fast when you're traveling. Wali Muslimin, Al Imam Muslimin said, Alaykum bi rukhsatillahi lati rakhasa lakum. Upon you is the ease and the simplicity Allah gave you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, take it. The benefits that we take from the hadith. Number one, how the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would ask. The situation of these companions, he would ask their situations. And he would ask them why their situation was like this. Number two. And this is an important issue. 
Because if you look at the hadith, what did the Prophet just said? say? He said, لَيْسَ مِنَ الْبِرِّ fi safar. It is not from righteousness, fasting whilst traveling. The Zahiriya took this hadith and they said, are you guys not hearing this? لَيْسَ مِنَ الْبِرِّ It is not from righteousness to fast whilst traveling. The Messenger said it clearly. So it is not permissible for you to travel, uh, to you, for you to fast whilst traveling. But the scholars, they responded and they said the context and the reasoning of why the messenger said restricts the meaning. That he's not talking about every fasting. He's referring to what type of fasting? The fasting that do, does you, the fasting that does you, I'm a, the fasting that treats you the way that this, this man has become. This type of situation is not permissible. Are we all together? In other words, the way that this man is, he's weak, he can't even move. This type of fasting is not from righteousness. But not, it's not every type of fasting. It's not what? It is not every type of fasting. It is not every... It's not every type of fasting. It's restricted to which type of fasting? Yeah? It's restricted to the fasting that the person becomes weak and can't do any ibadah, can't do anything else, is referring to that. That's the second benefit that we take from the hadith. That, that fasting here is not general. Don't take as-siyamu, ama as Don't take it general. It's talking about what fasting? The fasting that weakens you in the way that it weakens this man. The third benefit that we take from it is the permissibility of taking the ease when the Sharia gives it to you. Whatever the Sharia gives you as a rukhsa, as an ease, take that ease. And it's not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of weakness. The fourth benefit that we take from the hadith is if you see a people crowded somewhere and they're looking at something strange, it is not wrong for you to go and look at it. You're allowed to go and look at it. Are we all together, brothers? And you can't say to someone that it's haram for you to go and look. Sahih. But the type of looking that's haram is what? Looking at someone's house and peeping inside their house to see them. That's haram because that's a private place. As for things that are strange that are happening, are we all together? You're allowed to go and see it. And the messenger did that, alayhi salatu wasalam. When he saw the people crowded somewhere, he went and he looked at what they were looking at. This hadith is the wording of an Imam Muslim. It's the wording of an Imam Muslim, rahimahullahu ta'ala. Anasin said that, Kunna ma'an Nabi, we were with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi safari in a journey. Faminna sa'imu, some of us were fasting. Wa minna al muftiru, and some of us were not fasting. Fanazalna manzilan fi yawmin harrin, we came to a place. Manzilan, it's a particular, it's just a place. We came to a place. Fi yawmin harrin, it was a very hot day. It was a what? It was a very hot day. Wa akhtaruna dhillan. And the overwhelming majority of us, we had a shade. Amma wa akhtaruna, the one who had the most shade that day was Sahibul Kisai, the one, the possessor of the garment. Famina man yattaqi shamsa biyadi. Some of us will protect the sun from, it, from himself with his hand. قَالَ فَسَقَطَ الصُّوَّامُ The ones who were fasting, they dropped. They couldn't stand anymore, they dropped to their sides. 
it doesn't, it doesn't literally mean they fell down, but it means that they couldn't get up from their sleep and they couldn't get up from sitting down. They were so fatigued, very tired. وَقَامَ الْمُفْطِرُونَ And the ones who were not fasting, they stood up that day. فَضَرَبُوا الْأَبْنِيَ They built the tents. وَسَقَوُ الْرِكَابَ And they watered the riding beasts. They gave water to the riding beasts. They worked that day. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ The messenger then said, ذَهَبَ الْمُفْطِرُونَ The ones who were not fasting, the ones that weren't fasting, today they took their reward. Ones that were not fasting today took more reward than the ones who were fasting. The benefits that we take from the hadith is number one. It is permissible for you to break your fast and it's also permissible for you to fast if you want when you're traveling. Because the messenger consented to the action of both parties. The second benefit that we take from the hadith is breaking your fast is better than fasting. If there is a, a transitive benefit in it. What do I mean by that? That breaking your fast when you're traveling is better if you're going to benefit others. Are we all together brothers? The actions are two types. What are they brothers? You know the... Famous book that we studied, Al-Qawa'id Al-Fiqiyya, which is وَإِن تَزَاحَمْ عَدَدُ الْمَصَالِحِ يُقَدَّمُ الْأَعْلَامِ مِنَ الْمَصَالِحِ وَضِدُّهُ تَزَاحُمِ الْمَفَاسِدِ وَضِدُّهُ تَزَاحُمُ الْمَفَاسِدِ يُرْتَكَبُ الْأَدْنَى مِنَ الْمَفَاسِدِ If two goods are running besides each other, two good, you always have to take what? You have two goods besides each other. You have, you have to take one. Which one is better? The higher of the two good, the bigger of the two good. And if you're in a situation where you're forced to take one of the evil, you have to, you're in a situation, you would have to take one of the two evils. What do you, which one do you take? The lesser of the two. Are we all together? Example, fasting is a benefit. Is it not a benefit? and helping and supporting and aiding the Muslims that are around you is also what? It's a benefit. And you have a choice to do both. Choice. Because these people are travelers. They've, they've got a choice. They can either fast or they can help them, their brothers who are with them. Which one was best to do? Was to not fast and to help their what? The Muslims were with them. Reason being, why? Because the principle is, the good that involves others takes precedence over, over the good that's exclusive to you. Does that make sense? And Ibn Taymiyyah used a principle like that, Rahimahullah, from the statement of Imam Ahmad, Rahimahullah, that the Imam Ahmad said, for a person to expose the innovators and bring out their mistakes and their shortcoming is better for him to pray Qiyamul Layl and to fast. It's better for him to clarify the religion for the people. Why? Because this is a good that involves others. Things become clear to others. Whereas if he prays Qiyamul Layl, he's only doing it for himself. It's only going to benefit. And Imam Ahmed said this. And Shaykh Al-Islam Taymi transmitted this from him in his Majmu' Al-Fatawa. Are we all together? The same here is these Sahabas who helped their Muslim brothers took more reward than the ones who fasted. Why? Because the ones who fasted, they came with a good deed that was restricted to who? Just them. It was only restricted to them. Like in the, the other ones, they came with actions that involved their Muslim brothers. So they got more reward that day. They got more reward. And brothers, I advise you to learn fiqhul mufadalati bayna ta'at. Learn the fiqh behind the, the ranking of righteous deeds. This is one of the fiqh that many people don't study. Learning how to prioritize the good. And a lot of the times you're going to get caught up in situations where you're like, oh no, if I do this is good and this is good, which one shall I do? And youngsters, they always ask the question, shall I seek knowledge or shall I get married? 
you, it's, a, it's a good question. Many people ask, right? You will smile. Nah. That's a reality that you ask about. Which one is better? We'll leave it for another day, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah? And that's two good deeds. Which one do you give presidents to? And there's many things. Every one of us brothers will be caught up in situations in our lives where we have to choose between two goods. And we will also get caught up in our lives sometimes where we will have to do two harms, the lesser of the two. And if you haven't studied the fiqh behind, the ranking of righteous deeds and the ranking of evil, you're most likely going to fall into what? You're going to fall into what is not, necess- not necessary. That's why these sahabas got more reward than the ones who fasted that day because they understood that concept. The, how many benefits did I mention? I mentioned two, right? Third one now. The third benefit that we take from it is the virtue of serving. The third benefit that we take from this. The third benefit that we take from the hadith is the virtue of serving your brothers. And that it's from the religion. And it's also from manhood. Ar-rujula. That you're a man. Four. A lot of people, before I go into the fourth one, a lot of people they think, oh, I'm being used, people are using me. Islam defeats that, brothers. We, there's a saying that we have in the UK, every man for himself. We go to a restaurant, every man for himself, brother. You pay for your restaurant, your meal, and I'll pay for my own meal. We're brothers, we talk later, but every man for himself. I don't know. The brothers from the UK know that, the way we are. SubhanAllah. That's how everyone is. Every man for himself. Why do I have to water another person's camel? Why do I have to tend, build a tent for another Muslim? This is the idea that we will have in our minds. This hadith, it shows us that we're together. That we're together, that we should help each other. Number four. The permissibility of talking about the righteous deeds that you've done if it will lead to others following you in that footsteps. It's, it's permissible sometimes to point out the good that you've done if in it is it to what? Make others follow you in it. Sometimes. Okay, sometimes doesn't mean every time. Okay, brothers. Sometimes to point things out, it is permissible for others to follow you in it. نعم. عن عائشة رضي الله عنها قالت كان يكون علي, علي الصوم من رمضان فما أستطيع أن أقضي إلا في شعبان. This hadith is a very powerful hadith which is the concept of delaying bringing back Ramadan. A lot of people have Ramadan outstanding. Okay? And they haven't paid back the last Ramadan. What is the ruling in delaying paying it back? Aisha said, "Kana yakunu alayya sawmu." Fasting would be upon me. Min Ramadan from Ramadan, meaning some days of Ramadan is outstanding that I have to pay. فَمَا أَسْتَطِيعُ أَنْ أَقْضِيَ And I am unable to bring it back. I'm unable to bring it back. Illa fi Shaaban, except in the month of Shaaban. I'm unable to bring it back. The benefit that we take from this hadith is as follows. Number one, the permissibility of delaying, bringing back Ramadan up to Shaaban. That's like nearly a year. That's one month before the other Ramadan comes. You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to delay it. Second benefit that we take from the hadith is what is best is to hasten to paying back Ramadan if there's no excuse or reason. If there is no excuse or reason. Because Aisha had her reasons why she delayed it. Because what did she say? فَمَا أَسْتَطِيعُ I wasn't able to. I wasn't able to. 
So the person should hasten to it. Why should the person hasten to it? I mean, what's the evidence that shows that the person should hasten to paying it back? Number one, Allah told us in the Quran, Fastabiqul Khayrat, hasten to the good. And paying back Ramadan falls under hastening to good. Number two, the paying back is a debt. The paying back of Ramadan is a what? It's a debt. And every time a person hastens to paying back the debt, then that's better. Is it not? Giving back somebody his money is better than holding on to it and saying, I'm going to pay him next year. If you've got it, it's better to pay it back. Number three, if the person hastens in paying back Ramadan, he's able to fast the six days of Shawwal. Are we all together? And he's also able to fast Ayyamul Bid, the three white days. Here now we go to the issue of if you have days of Ramadan outstanding and the six days of Shawwal comes, I mean the month of Shawwal comes, Shawwal is the month after, after Ramadan and you have some days of Ramadan outstanding, you haven't paid it back, are you allowed to fast those six days of Shawwal? You haven't paid back Ramadan yet, are you allowed to fast those six days of Shawwal? The scholars, they have views, three views. There are three views. The first view is, You're not allowed to come with a voluntary act when the obligatory is outstanding. The wajib is outstanding. Bringing voluntary, no. And the reason why those scholars use this as an argument is, a hadith which is weak, which we won't mention. Which the Prophet said, من أدرك رمضان وعليه من رمضان شيء لم يقضيه لم يتقبل منه ومن صام تطوعا وعليه من رمضان شيء لم يقضيه فإنه لا يتقبل منه حتى يصومه. In other words, this hadith says, if there are Ramadan outstanding and you do voluntary, it will not be accepted from you. This hadith is weak because in the chain of narration is Ibn Lahia. Ibn Lahia is weak. There's another evidence that they used, the first party, I mean the first view. They said that the Prophet, did he not say, Man Sama Ramadan, anyone who fasts Ramadan, thumma atba'ahu sitta min shawwal, and then follows it up with six days of shawwal. So when did the shawwal come? After you fast Ramadan. Isn't that what the hadith said? Huh? The hadith said, the one who fasts Ramadan, and then follows it up with six days of shawwal. It's like he fasted the whole year. Are we all together, brothers? They said, this is our argument. We will respond to it, inshallah ta'ala, soon. The second group of scholars is, it is permissible to fast, the second view, is that it's permissible for you to fast the voluntary, even though the obligatory is outstanding. It is permissible. Okay? And this is the view of the Hanafiya, and one of the views of Ihda riwayataini in the Hanabila. It's one of the narrations from the Hanabila. Okay, and the, the first view is held by uh, Madhab al hanbaliya that's the Mu'tamad. The first view is the Mu'tamad, that, that which the Hanabila f- rely on. And Sheikh Abdurrahman Nasr al-Si'di, he strengthened the first view. Okay. The second view, Lakin, it's the Hanafi view. And it's also one of the two views of the Hanabila. And they said, that bringing back is from the obligatory acts which are unrestricted. They are free to be where. Does that make sense? Pay attention, brothers. I really want you guys to understand. I really want you guys to understand this issue. It's very important. Because every year people ask this question. The second view of scholars, they said, it's not about obligatory and voluntary here. That's not the discussion here. The discussion here is, a restricted ibadah and an unrestricted ibadah. Shawwal is restricted in a month. Like in bringing back Ramadan is not restricted. It can be brought back any time before the other Ramadan comes. Which one takes precedence? The restricted takes precedence over the unrestricted. Does that make sense to everybody? 
That's the argument that they took. And they responded from that perspective. The third view of scholars, they said, it is permissible to fast the voluntary, even though there are an obligatory outstanding, but it's disliked. It's really disliked. And this is the view of the Maliki and the Shafi'iyah. Is the view of the Maliki and the Shafi'iyah. The view that seems to be correct, well, the knowledge is with Allah Azza wa Jalla, is if a person is a, like for example, he's missed like five days of Ramadan, or ten days of Ramadan, or even 20 days of Ramadan, about 20. 23 or 24 days of Ramadan. So that's maximum, right? 23 or 24, maximum. Then he should bring back Ramadan first because he can bring Ramadan and Shawwal together. Are we all together? But if he missed the whole entire month of Ramadan, then he will never be able to come with Shawwal. Or if it's more than 24 days. If it's 25 days, he will never be able to come with what? Shawwal. So he brings the Shawwal and then he can come with the Ramadan if he wants to. Does that make sense? That's the safest of all of the views. Does that make sense, brothers? So if there's like 10 days of Ramadan on you, or 5 days of Ramadan on you, or 6 days of Ramadan on you, or even 3 days of Ramadan, or 4 days, then don't argue with this whole issue and look into it too much. Just bring back the 4 days of Ramadan and follow it up with the 6 days of Shawwal. And you have 10 days like that. You just have to fast for 10 days. Okay, brothers. Okay, another question is, does the fasting of Ramadan that you bring back, does it have to be consecutive like it used to be in the Ramadan days? Who, who's ever thought of that question? Put your hand up. In Ramadan, you were fasting every day. When you bring it back, you have four days that are, are, that are missing from your Ramadan. Do you have to bring those four one after the other? Or can you... Fast one day, relax one day, fast one day, and do it like that. Or does it have to be one after the other? Who's ever thought of that question? Assalamu Put your hand up if you've thought of that question before. MashaAllah. So the rest of the people never came to their minds. Uh, no, it doesn't matter how you do it. It's, it's all ways are, op- are allowed. Because of the ayah says, فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أخر. As Bring it back other days. And those days were not restricted in how you do it. The same way is the six days of Shawwal. Are we all together? The six days of Shawwal, you can do it separate. You don't have to make the six days one after the other. One after the other. Naam. Aisha, she said that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, Man mata, whoever dies, wa alayhi siyam. Someone died and there was fasting on him. There were outstanding fasting on him. There was Ramadan that he had to bring back. Man mata, whoever dies, wa alayhi siyam, there is fasting on him. Sama anhu waliyuhu, he's wali. Who are the wali? The wali are the people who inherit him. They're the people who what? Who inherit him. Who come under his inheritance. They will fast on his behalf. Someone has outstanding fasting. Are we all together? If you have days of Ramadan, I'm a days of an obligatory fast, your, your wali, your awliya, they have to fast on your behalf. That's what this hadith mentions. The scholars, they had an argument. The scholars had an argument here. Is this referring to every type of obligatory fasting? And we mentioned how many types of fasting? Three, right? But two are our main focus here. Ramadan and Nadar. Ramadan and 
Those are the two that concern us because the kafara is stuck to the individual who was meant to do it. It doesn't move on to anybody else. The two that are, we're looking at here is your mother, for example, she missed some days of Ramadan or a fasting of nether. She made a, a nether with Allah Azza wa Jalla that she will fast. Scholars, they differed in views. Some of the views they differed in is it is referring to every obligatory fasting. Whether it's Ramadan or whether it's nether, the family have to fast on behalf of their mother, for example. Does that make sense? Some scholars, they took it unrestricted. It's any obligatory fasting. That's one view. A second view is, and it seems like what Abdul Ghani ibn Abdul Wahid al Maqdisi is mentioning here, is that it's restricted to the nether. Because he was straight after that, what did he bring? وَأَخْرَجَ أَبُوْ دَاوُدٍ وَقَالَ هَذَا فِي النَّذْرِ This is restricted to the what? The fasting of a nether. It's restricted to the fasting of a nether. That if your mother has an outstanding fasting of Ramadan, you don't have to pay it back on her behalf. But if it is fasting of nether, you have to pay, pay it back on her behalf. Are we all together, brothers? And that which seems apparent to ilmu in Allah Azza wa Jalla is that it encompasses both and it's not obligatory. Are we all together? That encompasses Ramadan and it, and it encompasses other than Ramadan, which is another. Both of them are in there. And it's not obligatory for you to pay back on her behalf. It's not obligatory. Why is it not obligatory? Because let's say my mother passed away and then there was fasting that was outstanding on her and then I never fasted on her behalf. I didn't. I chose not to. If you say it's obligatory on me, then would I be sinning for not fasting on behalf of my mother? I'm asking you guys a question. I would be, right? Then where would we take the ayah? وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزَرْ أُخْرَى One does not take the burden of another person's mistake. You're placing my mother's missing of her fasting onto me. Her action, you're placing onto me. Are we all together? Does that make sense? So from that perspective, it shows that it's not obligatory. It's not obligatory. Highly recommended. Highly recommended. That you pay that fasting for your mother. That you pay that fasting on behalf of your mother. Naam. These two narrations that the Shaykh brought shows that one of the fasting was a month and one was the fasting of nether. That's why it encompasses both. Are we all together? That's why it encompasses both. Because a man came to the messenger and said, Ya Rasulullah, inna ummi matat, my mother died. Wa alayha and upon her is sawmu shahrin. One month was outstanding. Scholars, they said, that one month that's outstanding was a fasting she was able to fast and she didn't fast that's the one sorry it's the fasting which she was unable to fast you can fast on her behalf she never got the time to do it she was unable to do it she had an illness and she got cured she, she, she didn't get cured from that illness to go and pay it back or when she got better 
and as soon as she got on her feet, she died and she didn't pay it back. That's when you would pay it back on her behalf. But if she was heedless about it, she deliberately missed it. What did we mention last lesson? No one brings back what they missed deliberately. This is a view pushed by Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah and Imam al-Shafi'i. That if you miss a fasting deliberately, you're never allowed to bring it back again. The same is if you deliberately miss a Salah, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha and Fajr, deliberately, you can't bring it back. You can't. So we're referring to a fasting which she didn't get the chance to do. She, she had a reason for not doing it. A valid reason for not doing it. That's the one that you pay on behalf of your mother. Are we all together? Um, and this hadith has the same benefits of the um, it's, it's same meaning of the previous hadith. Naam. We're now going to go into hastening iftar. Hastening eating iftar. Sahal ibn Sa'ad al-Sa'idi radiyallahu ta'ala anhumah he said anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the messenger said la yazalu nasu grammatically I want you to benefit something. The word la is a negation. Yazalu fihi ma'na al-nafi. Yazalu has the meaning of negation in there. What was, what's the English principle? Negation, negation brings what? Affirmation. Nafyu, nafyu, isbat. So in other words, annasu bi khayrin. The people are upon good. Ma ajjalu al-fitra. As long as they hasten the breaking of their iftar. Some people they think, I'm strong. Allah mabarik. I'm strong. I'm going to delay it. And they think that's good. Yeah, I'm going to show the people. I'm not hungry. I'm going to let the food be on the table. Look at me. Don't. If the iftar is put on the table, hasten to it. Hastening to it, it's actually khair. The khair is connected to what? Hastening. It is hastening. And that's when the sun sets. When the sun sets, break it straight away. That's what one should do. What breaks your iftar? What is it that breaks your iftar? And the sunnah is? Dates, if you don't have it, water. Are you with me, brothers? And anything other than anything that used to break your fast would now be a iftar. Well, it was transmitted authentically from Abdullah ibn Umar that sometimes he would break his fast with intimacy because intimacy breaks fast. So anything would break that fast. Now, the second benefit that we take from the hadith is. We need to observe the boundaries set by the Sharia. Iftar is a set time and the fasting is a set time. We need to observe this. Our religion is not about fawda and corruption. The iftar came in, break it. The fasting started, start with it. That's how it is. The other benefit that we take from it is delaying the iftar is a reason for losing khair. We will lose khair if we delay the iftar. Because we go against the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also, our religion, it loves what's easy for the people. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, khuyira nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bayna shay'ayni. The prophet was never, two options were never placed in front of him. Illa akhada aysaruhuma, he'll always take the easy one. Nabi Muhammad. The hadith mentioned that two options were never placed in front of the messenger except that as long as it was both allowed, he would take the easiest of the two. As long as it was sanctioned by the sharia, he would take the easiest of the two. Naam. This hadith, the wording is Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah. This is the wording of Imam al-Bukhari. Umar said that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, إِذَا أَقْبَلَ اللَّيْلُ مِنْ هَا هُنَا When the night 
appears from here. وَأَدْبَرَ النَّهَارُ مِنْ هَا And the day turns its back on this way. فَقَدْ أَفْتَرَ الصَّائِمُ The one that is fasting, his fasting has broken. The first benefit that we take from this hadith is the time in which the fasting finishes are three ways. The breaking of the fast, there are three alamat. When you bring all of the hadith together, there are three signs. Number one is iqbalul layli min al mashriq. Is when the night, when the night comes and faces us. And the day turns, the second one is when the day turns its back on us. That's the second sign. And the third one is when the sun sets. And the asal, the original one that we look at is which one? When the sun sets. That's the one that we look at. A benefit that I want to mention here, which is a contemporary issue, somebody broke their fast in the airport. They're in, the middle, they're in Dubai International Airport. And they took a couple of dates because the sun set in Dubai. They're in Dubai, the sun set. So they threw some dates into their mouth, drank some water, and they went into the airplane straight away. As soon as the plane went up, what did they see? It's bright. It's bright outside. Is there a problem here? No. There's nothing upon them based on this hadith. Why? Because they broke their fast, what they saw when they were... Because the, 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 the plane, what is it going towards? It's going the direction where it's daytime. Are we all together? So your breaking of the fast was connected to who? To where you left. Naam. Here we're going to go into the ruling of continual fasting. The fasting of Al-Wisal, which is continual fasting. What is it? A person does not break their fast. This goes on. Continual fasting. The messenger said, Abdullah ibn Umar, he said, Naha Rasulullah, the messenger prohibited Anil Wisali, the continual fasting, where the person doesn't break their fast. The Prophet prohibited it. And when the Prophet prohibited it, the Sahabas, they said, Innaka tuwasilu, O Messenger of Allah, but you do wisal. You do the continual fasting. He then said, Inni lastu mithlakum. I am not like you guys. Inni ut'amu wa usqa. Allah gives me provision, food. And Allah also gives me, my thirst is quenched. And my hunger is, it's wiped away. My hunger is taken away from me. Abu Huraira and Aisha and Anas ibn Malik narrated this. Then the messenger said in another wedding by Muslim in Hadith Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, فَأَيُّكُمْ Whichever of you arada he wants, and you wasila, he wants to do continual fasting, then let him do it to suhoor. So meaning, don't do the iftar, miss the iftar if you want to, and carry on to the suhoor. But don't do two, two days consecutively. This hadith, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said something. He said, I am provided, food is given to me, and my thirst is quenched. The scholars, they differed. What does that mean? That I, food is given to me and my thirst is quenched. What does that mean? There's two opinions. Some scholars, they took it literal. That the Prophet gets food sent to him. And water is given to him. Alayhi salatu wasalam. And that it doesn't break his fast. Some scholars, they took that. Karamat al This is where Allah was honoring him. And another group of scholars, they said, no, this is not literal. No, it's not literal. It means that the thing that food gives you, which is the energy, the messenger's given that energy already, it's built in him. Like he doesn't get tired and fatigued. And this second view is the strongest. It's a second view is the strongest. 
and it's the view chosen by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, ibn al-Qayyim, al-Shawkani, ibn Baz, ibn Uthaymin, ibn al-Si'di, rahimahullah. All of those scholars, they said the second view makes sense. Why? Because if he eats and he drinks, then he's not fasting, is he? And they said, oh, no, 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 no. He gets food and drink brought from Jannah. It still doesn't eliminate that he's a human in this world. Wherever the food comes from, he's not fasting. Does that make sense, brothers? So that's one point that we need to understand. The second thing that we want to understand from the hadith, inshallah ta'ala, is the continual fasting. Is it prohibited? Is it prohibited? No, it's not prohibited. The reason why it's not prohibited is because the messenger said to the companions when he, they wanted to fast with him, he said to them, you guys are unable to do it. You guys can't be able to do it. You can't. I can't, but you guys can't. So in other words, if they can do it like he can, they're allowed to do it. And the only reason why he prohibited was lack of ability. Lack of ability. And some of his companions actually did it with him. Another benefit that we take from the hadith is the sahabas, they question the messenger's action and statements not being the same. They questioned him. He said, Ya Rasulullah, but you do it. When he said to them, you can't do the wisal, but they said, you do it. And then he explained it to them, Sallallahu alayhi, alayhi wa sallam. And this shows us that every single body will be scrutinized whatever they say if they don't do it. Are we all together, brothers? That your speech and your actions should be the same. And the messenger didn't become angry and say, how dare you ask me? But he explained it to them, alayhi, alayhi salatu wasalam. And he explained to them, the reason why he does, he does it. And that he was only doing it out of concern uh, for them. That he was only doing it out of concern for them. The author, Rahimahullah, Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid Al Maqdisi, Rahimahullah, he now goes into Afdalu Siyami, the most virtuous of fasting. What is the best form of fasting? And that's the, we're going to be talking about that until the ending, inshallah ta'ala, of today's class. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, he said, Ukhbira Rasulullah, the messenger was informed. The word Ukhbira, it is Al Maf'ulu Ladi Lam Yusamma Fa'ilu, grammatically. It is the object where the subject was not mentioned, meaning the person who told the Prophet was not mentioned. Ukhbira, the messenger was informed. But another narration, it mentions. Al-Mukhbir, the one who informed. There's another, narration who there's another narration that tells us who is the one who told the Prophet وسلم, about Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As. And that was his own father, Amr ibn As. Amr ibn As went to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, my son Abdullah, I have married him off to the best of the women of Quraysh. The best women of Quraysh. That hasabin min Quraysh. The best woman of Quraysh. 
But look how he deals with her. He fasts all day and he prays Qiyam Layl all night. Does he give this woman any rights? Because if he's fasting all day, he's not going to have time to spend with her. He's in ibadah. She might want him as a husband. And at night, he's praying. He doesn't even know what she's doing. He's praying. That's what he was doing. So his father complained about him. When his father informed the Prophet ﷺ about his son, the Messenger وسلم, he asked him, is it true that you do this? Is it something you do? And he said, yeah, O Messenger of Allah, I do. And what was it that he said? Wallahi la asumanna nahara. I'm going to fast all day. Wala aqumanna layla ma'ishtu. As long as I live all day and every night, daytime I'm fasting, nighttime I'm going to be praying. And I'm going to do that until I die. Faqultu lahu. Then the messenger asked him, Is it true you said this? He said, Qad qultu. Oh, Messenger of Allah, I said it. It's true. I did say that. Bi abi anta wa ummi. I free my mother and father for you. Qala the messenger then said to him, فَإِنَّكَ لَا تَسْتَطِيعُ ذَلِكَ You can't do that. You don't have the ability to do that. فَصُمْ وَأَفْتِرْ Fast one day and break your fast one day. وَقُمْ وَنَمْ أَمَا فَصُمْ وَأَفْتِرْ Sorry, sorry. Fast and break your fast. Don't just keep fasting. Fast and break your fast. Pray and also sleep. وَصُمْ مِنَ الشَّهْرِ ثَلَاثَةِ أَيَّامٍ Every month try to fast three days. فَإِنَّ الْحَسَنَةِ بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهَا Because the righteous deeds is multiplied by ten. So if he fasts three times a month, it's like he fasted the whole entire year. Because how many, how many days in the month? Thirty. Ten, ten, ten. Thirty, right? Thirty means the whole entire year, right? So you're fasting every day. If you wanted it, you got it. The messenger told him, إِنَّ الْحَسَنَةِ فَإِنَّ الْحَسَنَةِ بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهَا Oh, do that. قُلْتُ فَإِنِّي أُطِيقُ أَفْضَلَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ Oh, Messenger of Allah, I can do more than that, he said, because he was young. He said, I can do more than that. Just three days a month, I can do more. And then the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to him, فَصُمْ يَوْمًا وَأَفْضِرْ يَوْمَيْنِ Okay, fast one day, then relax for two days, and then fast again. قُلْتُ فَإِنِّي أُطِيقُ أَفْضَلَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ I can do better than that, he said. Then the messenger said, Fasum yawman wa after yawman. Fast one day and break a fast the other day. Meaning, you fast Monday, don't fast Tuesday, fast Wednesday. Wa hakada. Fadalika siyamu Dawood. Nabilah Dawood, that was his fasting. Wa hu afdalu siyami, and that's the best form of fasting. The best fasting is the fasting of Dawood. Fakul to Aidan said, Fa'ini utiku afdala min dalik. I can do better than that. The messenger then said to him, La sawma fawqa sawma Dawood. There's no fasting after the fasting of Dawood. That's it. There's, that's the limit. Because if he pushes after Dawood, he's going to go back to what he was doing right now. He's going to fast every day, right? He said, No. Sum yawman after yawman. Benefits that we take from the hadith. The benefits that we take from the hadith. Number one, the virtue of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As. How virtuous this man was. How he strived to ibadah. How he loved khair. He swore by Allah that he's going to fast every day in the year. And that he's going to pray Qiyamul Layl every night. Look how eager and hungry he was for worshipping Allah Azza wa Jalla. The second benefit that we take from the hadith is how our religion is easy. Simplicity. Doesn't like complication. The third benefit that we take from the hadith is that it's not liked to stand every single night. Why? Because the messenger said, Qum wa nam. Stand up and sleep. It's disliked for you to pray from Isha to Fajr. It's disliked. It has to be a part where you sleep. Because the messenger said, stand up and also sleep. The fourth benefit that we take from this is the, virtues of, the virtue of fasting Three days of every month. And that it's equivalent to fasting the whole entire year. The scholars, they differed now. What are these three days? These three days 
that are equivalent to the fasting of the whole year, what is it actually? Some of the scholars, they said it is the three white days. And that's the view of the overwhelming majority of scholars. And others have differed and said, no, it's not. It's any time within the month, as long as you just fast three days. Like in what seems strong is the three white days. The fifth benefit that we take from the hadith is the best form of fasting is to fast the fasting of Nabi Allah Dawood. The sixth benefit that we take from this is the righteous deeds is multiplied up to ten. And that's from the virtues of Allah. مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَالِهَا وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالسَّيِّئَةِ فَلَا يُجْزَى إِلَّا مِثْلُهَا إِلَّا مِثْلَهَا If a person comes with good, it will be multiplied by ten. What about if he comes with a sin? Only one. A man came to Abu Hanifa. He said, Abu Hanifa, I will steal money. He came to, a man came to Abu Hanifa. He said, I will steal some money. When I steal the money, how many sins do I get? One. Because I stole. And then I give it in sadaqah. How many rewards do I get? Ten. Subtract the one sin from it. How much am I left with? I'm left with nine, nine rewards. Abu Hanifa said, was it accepted in the first place for you to get the ten? To get the ten means that the first time that you gave it in sadaqah, it was accepted. It wasn't accepted, Aslan. You stole the money. It's like you never gave it out in the first place. But there's a benefit that you need to understand that Imam Al-Qarafi pointed out, which is the only nation whose righteous deeds are multiplied is this ummah. It's a unique thing for this ummah, that the righteous deeds are multiplied. Are we all together? Like for example, the fasting that we, fa- sorry, the prayer that we pray. How many prayers do we pray? Five. What's the reward? Fifty. That's fifty, right? This is something unique for this ummah. But the sins are not always one. It changes from time to time and place to place. There are some sins that are multiplied due to the timing and due to the what? A place. Allah said in the ayah, وَمَن يُرِدْ فِيهِ بِإِلْحَادٍ نُذِقْهُ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ وَمَن يُرِدْ فِيهِ بِإِلْحَادٍ بِظُلْمٍ نُذِقْهُ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Anyone who wants to cause oppression and wrongdoings in the house of Allah in Mecca, Allah said we will make them taste a severe punishment. Mecca, doing a sin in Mecca is not like doing a sin in any other place in the world. Sins, it's not equal in Mecca and outside Mecca. With Idalik ibn Abbasin, it was mentioned that when he grew older, he said to his family, take me out of Mecca now. When he grew older, Abdullah ibn Abbas. Because he said, if I do a mistake, and I'm prone to do a mistake now because I'm old, I don't want it to be multiplied. Are we all together? The other benefit that we take from the hadith is, are you allowed to say to someone, I free my mother and father for you? Or is this unique to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The overwhelming majority of the scholars are of the opinion that saying, I free my mother and father for you is not restricted to the messenger. It's not restricted to him. But it's permissible for what? For anybody who you respect and anyone you love, your shaykh, your murabbi, you can say that to them. They, the overwhelming majority of scholars said that. And great scholars have chosen that opinion. So from them is Ibn Abi Asim in his kitab Adab al Hukama, Al Imam al Tabari, Ibn Jarir al Tabari, Al Imam al Nawawi. They mentioned that it's permissible for other than the Messenger. So there's a difference of opinion on that, re- on that regard. Um, also, that we, what we take from the hadith is the permissibility of swearing when no one asks you to swear by Allah. 
ودل عبد الله بن عمرو بن عاصي والله لا اصومن النهار ولا اقومن الليل اي سوي باي الله ام غنا براي all night and i'm going to fast all day no one told him to swear by allah he chose to swear by allah it is permissible to swear by allah even though you weren't asked to swear by allah also the benefit that we take from the hadith is if you swore by allah and then someone points you towards a direction better than what you made the oath for then you should leave it if you say, Wallahi, I'm going to do this. And then someone comes up to you and says to you, but that's not good. This is even better that you leave what you saw by and you take what is better. And you do what is, what is better. And you need to do kafara for expiation for your oath, right? You have to do expiation for your oath. The, also the benefit that we take from this hadith is how kind and generous and concerned the messenger was for Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, how he cared about his companions. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, You're not able to do this. You were not able, you're not able to do this. How he was concerned about his companions. The other benefit that we take from this hadith is it is not about how much ibadah that you do. It's about how consistent you are upon it. The actions that are most beloved to Allah are that is that which is consistent even if it's even if it's little. Ridalik Allah Ta'ala He rebuked a group of people who initiated ibadah, they came with ibadah and they forsaked it later. They didn't carry it on. Allah says, means after they in initiated ibadah, after they came with good deeds, what did Allah say? They didn't observe this righteous action. They didn't carry on. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, when he grew older, he even he, he himself, he regrets why he didn't take the Prophet's advice. He regretted it when he grew older. He said, why did I not take the Messenger's advice? Because he told me I won't be able to do this. And look at Abdullah ibn Amr al-As. He took on the fasting of Dawood, right? And when he grew older, he wasn't able to carry on the fasting of Dawood. He felt weak and unable. And he said, if only I listened when I was told. And that benefits us that the wise people don't look at things at that current moment. The wise person looks at what it's going to lead to. They look at beyond what it is right that moment. Are we all together? And also what we benefit from this hadith is Abdullah ibn Amr al-As's action, which is that he died and he used to fast the fasting of Dawood. Because he said something very powerful. He said, I am not going to be one who's told the Prophet I'm going to do this. And then after the Prophet, I change. I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to be upon what the messenger knew me to be upon. And he's grown old now. But you all know Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As was the most in narrating from the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. True or false? Was he not? Even Abu Huraira said, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As had more narrations than I. He took more from the Prophet because he used to narrate at a time when I never used to narrate. But why is it that we have more narrations of Abu Huraira? is because Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As in the last stages of his life, he went towards ibadah. He turned towards ibadah. So he left off narrating hadiths. Whereas Abu Huraira, he would sit down and narrate everything he heard. Are we all together? Like in Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, he went more to ibadah. And salah and ibadah took him more. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Also what we benefit from this hadith is, that we can sometimes do the actions of the early nation. The fasting was whose fasting? The fasting of Nabi Lahi Dawood. This was Dawood's fasting. As, and so, there are things that we can take from the other nations, the other Umam. Are we all together? Some things we can't take from them. And that is permissible to take from the previous nations. And Nabi Lahi Dawood, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at Dawood. Dawood, all of his life, he used to fast one day and not fast the other day. Dawood was like that. And Allah described Dawood with two things. Um, abdana Dawooda Aidi. This is the ayah we're going to busy ourselves with. Wadkur abdana Allah said, remember our slave. Who? Dawooda. Muhammad. Remember our slave Dawood. Dal Aidi. What does Dal Aidi mean? Mujahidin he said, Al Aidi here means Al Quwwatu fi Ta'a. He had un, he had strength in Nabilahi Dawood in Ibadah and in Ta'a. Are we all together, brothers? Dawood had strength in Ta'a and obedience. Naam. This hadith, Abu Huraira says, O Sani Khalili, my Khalil told me. What is Abu Huraira referring the Prophet with? What is he calling the Prophet? A Khalil. How do we reconcile between that and the statement of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, Inni abra'u ilallahi, I free myself. An yakuna li minkum Khalil, for me to have any one of you as my Khalil. The messenger saying, I free myself from taking any one of you as my Khalil. I can't. In another narration, the Prophet said, لَوْ كُنْتُ مُتَّخِذًا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ خَلِيلًا لَوْ كُنْتُ مُتَّخِذًا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ خَلِيلًا لَاتَّخَذْتُ أَبَا بَكْرٍ خَلِيلًا If I was to ever take anyone on this earth as my Khalil, I would take Abu Bakr as my Khalil. But I won't, because Allah took me as his Khalil. So how do we reconcile between that? And Abu Huraira saying, my Khalil said, it's a one way. Abu Huraira is talking about him seeing the Prophet as a Khalil. But the Messenger didn't see anyone else as Khalil except Allah Azza wa Jalla. Because Khalil is a only one way relationship. And it can only be given to one person. Are we all together? And the Messenger already said, I gave this to who? I gave it to Allah. But if there was anyone on this earth, I would give it to. It would be who? Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr reached a high level in the eyes of the Messenger. Alayhi salatu wasalam, that no one else reached. Abu Bakr. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasalam, the hadith of Abu Darda, Umar and Abu Bakr had a conflict. When they d- differed on something, Abu Bakr, he asked Umar for forgiveness. They had a conflict, they had a fallout, they had a conflict. And so Abu Bakr rushed to Umar. Abu Bakr, he rushed to Umar and he said, forgive me. And Umar said, I forgive. I'm not going to forgive you. I am not going to forgive you. Abu Bakr ran to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He came to the Prophet of Allah. And the reason why he came to the Messenger was so the Messenger could speak to Umar to forgive Abu, to forgive Abu Bakr. Allahu Akbar. Look at the Sahabas, Wallahi. He wants the Prophet to intercede on his behalf to take it for him, that forgiveness from Umar. So Abu Bakr came rushing to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Abu Bakr, when he was walking, the Messenger was sitting with his companions and he saw Abu Bakr walking from far. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he looked at the companions and he looked at Abu Bakr and he said, Abu Bakr, something has taken him. There's something on his mind. There's something stressing Abu Bakr out. When Abu Bakr came, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he stood up, he remained standing, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, whilst Abu Bakr is talking to the Prophet, Umar came to think about what took place between him and his brother Abu Bakr, and he knocked on the door of Abu Bakr's house, and Abu Bakr wasn't there. And so he realized straight away that he went to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so Umar made his way to who? To the Messenger. As Abu Bakr and the Messenger and the companions are, stand, are, they are there, Umar came walking from the same direction. He came walking from the same place. He came walking. 
And the messengers saw Umar from far, فَتَمَعَّرَ وَجْهُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. The messenger's face became scrolled. He became angry. He became very upset with Umar. And at that point, Abu Bakr saw the facial reaction of the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم. فَجَسَ عَلَى رُكْبَتَيْ Abu Bakr fell on his knees. Abu Bakr fell on his knees. And he looked at the messenger and said, Ya Rasulullah, أَنَا الَّذِي بَدَأْتُ The conflict started from me. I was the one who did the mistake, not Umar. Again, wanting to defend the honor of his brother. Not wanting the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be upset with Umar. Ya Rasulullah, it's me. I'm the one who did the mistake. I'm the one who came with the, the uh, wronging here. The messenger didn't listen to what Abu Bakr was saying. He waited for Umar to come. And then when Umar came, the messenger addressed not just Umar but everybody. He said to them, Abu Bakr wasani bi ahlihi wa mali. Abu Bakr aided me and supported me with his wealth and his family. His family were the ones who used to bring the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the food in the mountain when he ran away from Mecca. And he was going to Medina. It was his Abu Bakr's daughter Asma who ripped her garment and put the food on there and placed it on her back and used to climb that big mountain to bring the food to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so he can eat. And her father can eat. And it was only her father that the messenger selected to go with him to Medina. No other person did he choose. It's, he spent all of his money on me, he said. The Prophet said this. And he also spent his family were there for me. فَإِنَّهُ آمَنَ بِي He believed in me at a time where all of you disbelieved in me. Abu Bakr believed in me. He never questioned me. He believed in me. فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ تَارِكُوا لِي صَاحِبِي Are you not going to leave my companion alone for me? As though the rest weren't companions. As, as though the rest were not companions. Of course they were. Would you not leave, would you not leave my companion for me? Abu Darda said that day onwards, no one dared to say anything back to Abu Bakr. His status was realized. No one ever dared to say anything. Abu Bakr was the only person that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said, Ma min ahadin. The Messenger said this about Abu Bakr only. That there is no one who had rights on me except that I gave him back his rights. I paid him back in full. Or even more. Illa Abu Bakr. Except Abu Bakr. Fataraktu mukafa'atahu lillah. I have left Allah to reward him. I couldn't reward Abu Bakr to what he has done for me. Are we all together, brothers? Abu Bakr, the person who hates Abu Bakr, who has hate in Abu Bakr towards Abu Bakr, is nothing but a hypocrite. He's a munafiq, the one who hates Abu Bakr. And that person doesn't want to just attack Abu Bakr. And it's not just Abu Bakr who he is against. He really wants to get to the Messenger. It is the Messenger who he wants to slander. It is the Messenger who he wants to get to. Abu Bakr is the most beloved person to the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. Radiyallahu ta'ala, radiyallahu ta'ala anu. Then the Messenger didn't take anyone as his khalil on this earth. And if he was, who would have it been? Abu Bakr. Radiyallahu ta'ala, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. So the scholars, they said that Abu Huraira saying Khalili is referring to his way of looking at the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He saw the Prophet as a Khalil. There were three things that the Prophet advised him. Siyamu thalathati ayyami min kulli shahr. Every month, fast three days. Wa rak'atayu duha. And you pray two rak'a duha. Wa an utira qabla an anam. And that I do witr before I go to sleep. Brothers, if you're a Muslim who has learned this hadith today, who loves Allah and His Messenger, a true believer, this should be something you implement in your life today, from today onwards. That every single three times a month you fast, those three days of the month you fast, that you pray the two rak'ayid duha, and that you do witr, just one rak'a. Is that hard, brothers? Before you go to sleep. Just one witr, one rak'a. Pray it and go to sleep. Huh? 
yeah, we're going to go to that when we come to the Salatul Taraweeh. We're going to designate one of the lectures on the issue of Taraweeh, inshallah ta'ala. Are you allowed to pray Salah after Witr? Does your Witr have to be? What about if you don't want to pray, uh, you want to carry on some prayer at home, and etc. We'll speak about that, inshallah ta'ala. Salatul Duha. Hey, what's Salatul Duha? It's a prayer that's prayed. Anyone knows what the Salatul Duha is? Ha. Huh? It's prayed after the sun is uh, sun rises. It's before Duhur. Huh? Salatul Duha. What's the what, why do we pray Salatul Duha? What does it do for us? Kullu sulaba bin al nasi alayhi sadaqa. Kullu yomin tatlu alayhi shams sadaqa. Every joint of your body, it requires a sadaqa that you need to pay for it. And so Salatul Duha is that is the way to pay the sadaqa of your bo- your joints Naam. the benefit that we take from the hadith is as follows how the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam's sincere advice was to his companions how we sincerely advise them and that which would bring them closer to allah azza wa jalla he was a sincere advisor and you have to be a person who's like that as well abu huraira said my the prophet advised me three things whenever you see the muslims advise them what is good the benefit that we take from the hadith is the virtue of Salatul Duha. The benefit that we take from the hadith is fasting three days every month. The benefit that we take from the hadith is I don't want to use the word boasting but mentioning your companion, your, your relationship with someone who's high. To be, the word boastful is a very negative thing, but to say to people, you know, my Khalil said, like Abu Huraira said, he's proud to be connected to the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. The permissibility of doing that. If someone is honorable and righteous, you can say, so so, so and so and me are close friends and and etc. It is permissible. It is permissible. And the scholars, they say, it enters under at-tahadduthu bi ni'matillahi. Mentioning the best blessings of Allah upon you. Okay, but it's not that you're trying to belittle others, okay? The virtue that we take from the hadith is al-witr qabla al the witr before you sleep. Also, the benefit that we take from the hadith is anyone can see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as his khalil. It's not just Abu Hurairah. Anyone can see the Prophet Aziz Khalil. I can say Khalili, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Naam. The bana- this hadith, Muhammad ibn Abbad ibn Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, Amar rahimahullahu ta'ala, Sa'altu Jabir ibn Abdillahi radiallahu ta'ala anhu ma. I asked Ab- Jabir ibn Abdillahi, Anaha al-Nabiyu, did the messenger prohibit an sawmi yawm al-Jum'ati? Did the messenger prohibit the fasting of Friday? Did he make it haram? Qala na'am. Jabir said yes. In another wording, in Sahih Muslim, he said, وَرَبِّ الْكَعْبَةِ By the Lord of the Kaaba. By the Lord of the, the Kaaba. The benefits that we take from the hadith is the, the permissibility of, of speaking and talking when you're doing tawaf around the Kaaba. Can anyone, can anyone here tell me how I extracted the benefit from this hadith? Who can see where I got that benefit from? Yeah? How did I get that benefit from this hadith? Huh? Lord of the Kaaba. How? Tawaf on the Lord of the Kaaba. Muhammad ibn Abdullah, you wouldn't be able to see easily. It's hard to see it. Just wanted to know if somebody did. Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Ja'farin, 
asked Jabir ibn Abdullah this question while he was doing tawaf around the Kaaba. He asked this question to him, did the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibit fasting of the Friday? Jabir was doing tawaf around the Kaaba because as a riwayah it says, وَهُوَ يَطُوفُ بِالْبَيْتِ While he was doing tawaf around the Kaaba. So that shows when you're doing tawaf around the Kaaba, you can give fatwas and answer questions. Why am I mentioning that? Because the scholars, they say, tawaf is like salah. You need tahara to do tawaf, right? Do you not? Of course you need it. The difference is you can talk in this one and the other one you can't talk. Are we all together, brothers? The benefit that we take from the hadith is the prohibition in fasting Friday is when you restrict it to Friday only. Ifradul Jum'ah. The prohibition is only when you make it Friday by itself. But if you fast a day before it or a day after it, it's not a problem. Okay, brothers. The prohibition of fasting Friday is restrict is, is about when you only fast Friday. You come and you fast Friday and you don't fast any other day. That's when the prohibition comes. Okay? Is the prohibition here haram? The scholar, the overwhelming majority of scholars are of the opinion that the fasting of Friday, the prohibition is karaha. It's not tahrim. And they say the reason is because is Eid. Are you allowed to fast Eid? If you, are you allowed to fast on Eid? What about if you fast the day before it? It's still not allowed. Eid you can never fast. Wala qabla wala ba'da. Whether before it or after it. But Jum'ah you are allowed to fast it a day before it or a day after it. And they said this is an indication that it's not haram. That's, that it's not haram. Even that though Jum'ah is what? It's a Eid. But you're still allowed to fast it. Are we all together brothers? As long as you fast a day before it or a day after it. Also the benefit that we take from the hadith is if someone asks you a question, you can just answer by saying yes. You don't have to give a full answer. And some people are like, Akhi, your fiqh is very weak. Someone asks you a big question. And all you just said is three letters. Naam. Yeah, you can say naam. Why not? Are we all together? It's not necessarily fiqh that you talk too much. Are we all together, brothers? Talking too much is not necessarily fiqh. Look at the Messenger and what he said in these hadiths. And look how, many, how long I'm talking for. The Messenger is saying one thing and we're just bringing out so many fawaid out of it. Sah? وَلِذَلِكَ إِبْنُ رَجَبِ الْحَنْبَلِ He wrote a book, he called it فَضْلُ عِلْمِ السَّلَفِ عَلَىٰ عِلْمِ الْخَلَفِ The knowledge of the Salaf, how it was better than the knowledge of the Khalaf. What was the virtue of the scholars of the early generation? They would say something very little. But we come, talk, talk, talk. And everybody's like, wow, did you see how he talked? Are you with me, brothers? Ahadu Mashaykhina, one of our shuyukh, Sheikh Saleh ibn Abdullah ibn Hamad al usaymi one of the things that you see in his khutbahs is, it's 15 minutes. Sheikh Usaymi's khutbahs are 10, 15 minutes. Wallah. What did the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? The person's khutbah being short is in, as, it's an indication for a short khutbah. And his salah being long is an indication of his fiqh. Shows you this man is, he chooses his words, he's to the point, and he doesn't talk too much. Sah brothers. That's important. Naam. This hadith is, is talking about what I spoke about before, which is the prohibition of fasting on Friday by itself. If you want to fast on Friday, what do you do? One day before it or one day after it? 
There are two situations where fasting on Friday is permissible. One, the messenger mentioned it here, which is as long as you're fasting one day before it or one day after it, you are allowed to fast on Friday with, if, you, if that condition is met. The second condition is, إِذَا صَادَفَ يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ If the day of Jum'ah happens to fall on عَادَةٌ لِلْإِنسَانِ I used to normally fast on the fasting of Dawood and it hit a Friday. My fasting of Dawood, where Dawood used to fast one day and miss one day and fast one day and miss one day, it hit a Friday. There's no problem with that. Because the Messenger Sallallahu said in another hadith, in hadith Abi Huraira, إِلَّا أَن يَكُونَ فِي صَوْمٍ يَصُومُهُ أَحَدُكُمْ If it's a fasting, of a, if it falls on a fasting, that a person used to fast. Those are the only two times when you can fast on Friday. The first one is, you're fasting one day before it or one day after it. The second one is, Friday happens to fall on a, a routine that you had. Now. This hadith is the wording of Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala which is that it is haram for a person to fast on Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitri. Why is it haram for you to fast Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitri? Why is it haram? The reason why Eid al-Fitri it's haram for you to fast is because you need to distinguish Ramadan from what? The Eid. You have to distinguish one from the other. Or else Ramadan is still going on. If you fast on Eid, then Ramadan hasn't finished. Are we all together, brothers? What about Eid al-Adha? Why is it made haram? Because the person should eat his nusuk that he bought for hajj. His, his anam sheep or whatever, he needs to eat that. So because of those two reasons, it is prohibited. Another benefit that we take from the hadith is Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu he did a khutbah and he stated that it's prohibited for you to fast on these two days Eid al-Fitri and Eid al-Adha and he did this on Eid day which Eid was it? It was Eid al-Adha the benefit that we take from this hadith is the khutbah should be relevant some people are reading a khutbah that was written a hundred years ago in a situation totally different from our situation by a sheikh that's living in another country a khutbah that he wrote that's not related to this situation are we all together brothers? the khutbah should be based upon the relevant problems that the Muslims are going through and a situation that arose you bring the Quran and the Sunnah and you apply it on that situation are we all together? Does that make sense? Don't bring a khutbah book that was written back home from your country that doesn't apply what? In that current situation. It doesn't apply. You get the Quran and the Sunnah and you apply the situation in that land that you're in. Because Allah wa Ta'ala, He says that the messengers, what are they sent to? They are sent to their people so they can clarify things for them. Some people, they don't come to any other circles of knowledge except khutbah to jumuah that's the only time that they get reminders that's the only time that they get to hear the speech of allah azza wa jalla and so the people who are going on the pulpit they need to talk about relevant issues Th things that are relevant to the community and what they are going through the benefit that we take from this hadith also is if you hear a knowledge you don't have to seek permission from the person who told you whether you can convey that knowledge that was told to you. Okay? You can't. وَلِذَلِكَ سَعَدِ بْنُ عُبَيْدٍ He participated Umar radiallahu anhu's khutbah. He heard it. 
he didn't take permission from Umar if he can convey this knowledge. He went and he conveyed it. Because the principle is, الشاهد منكم الغائب. Let the one who is present convey to the one who is absent. Okay? Now. This hadith, it, the benefits that we take from it, number one, is that it's prohibited in fasting Eid al Fitri wal Adha, and that's haram. Is it only haram? No, it's not only haram. If you fast, it, it won't be accepted. It won't even be accepted. Are we all together, brothers? And I want you to remember some things, brothers. Not everything that's haram is not, nece- is not necessarily rejected. Not everything that's haram or that's prohibited is necessarily rejected. What do I mean by that? Somebody prayed in clothes that he stole from a shop. Is it haram to steal people's clothes? <coughs> but if he prays on that clothes, is it salah accepted? Ah, it's accepted, salah. But it's haram to steal clothes. Are we all together? But his Allah is accepted with the sin on, on, on him. Are we all together? And I'm not going to go into more details, but you have to know the difference between a prohibition that goes back to the essence of the ibadah. I'm a prohibition that goes to شروطي, one of its conditions. Sa'ad was the third one. And the third one is a prohibition that goes back to إلى أمر خارجي an external issue. Uh, that's a side point. If you want to learn more about that, go to the books of Usul al-Fiqh. In other words, if you fast on Eid, it's prohibited. And it's not only prohibited, but also your fasting is not accepted. It's not accepted. The benefit that we take from this hadith also is the wisdom in how the Sharia is legislated. We take the wisdom in how the Sharia is legislated. The third benefit that we take from the Hadith is that we are not allowed to imitate the non-Muslims. Because the Hadith mentions that we are prohibited from praying Salah two times. When is it? After As-Subh Fajr and what? And after Al-Asr. Why are we prohibited from praying these two times? Because the kuffar and the non-Muslims, they prostrate to the sun at these two times. When the sun rises and when the sun sets. So we should not imitate them. We should not. We should not imitate them. Naam. The last hadith that we're going to take for today. The virtue of fasting in the cause of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Abi Sa'id al Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, Man saama ramad, man saama yawman, anyone who fasts a day, fi sabilillah, for the sake of Allah. What does it mean, fi sabilillah? The scholars they differed on two views. What is meant by fi sabilillah? Some scholars they said, fi sabilillah here means whilst in the battlefield as a mujahid he fasts because they said that the word sabilillah when it's unrestrictedly mentioned it doesn't go back to accept the jihad sabilillah when you hear it in the itlaq when it's unrestrictedly said they said it goes back to it goes back to the jihad and that's the opinion by al-imam al-bukhari and ibn al-jawzi rahimahullah amma rahimahumullah the second view is it means anyone who fast a day in obedience to Allah 
in obedience to Allah. And that's the second view, and that view is the view of Al Imam uh, Al Qurtubi and Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz. He said, Wahada qawlun qawi. Ibn Baz said, This is a very strong opinion. It's a very strong opinion. As for which of those two is strongest? Well, ilmu inda Allah. Allah knows. I don't know. I don't know which one's stronger. Ba'ad Allah wajhahu anin nari sab'ina kharifa. Allah distanced that person from the f- his face. Allah will distance his face from the hellfire. Sab'ina kharifa. 70 autumns. Ama? Americans, they say fall, right? The seasons are how many? Four. The first one is ar rabi' spring. The second one is As-Saif, summer. Al-Kharif, autumn. And Al-Shita, which is winter. Those are the four. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he chose Allah will distance their, your, their person's face, the one that fasted for Allah's sake, in obedience to Allah. He fast one day, just one day. Allah will distance your face 70 years. Where did I get 70 years from? Because one autumn to the other autumn is a year, right? Is it not? Why did the messenger choose the word autumn? Autumn is the month where everything is cleansed before winter comes. The f- trees, they lose everything. It cleans everything off it. Are we all together? The Arabs, they used to refer to that as the month of cleansing. But the 70 mentioning of it, the scholars, they mention is ala wajhil mubalagha. It doesn't mean 70 by that figure. It just means Exaggeration in number. 70 is commonly used, but it doesn't mean the, the figures. Because remember the Prophet ﷺ, he said in the ayah, um, Allah mentioned sorry, in the ayah, Istaghfil lahum, aw la tastaghfil lahum, in tastaghfil lahum, sab'ina marratan, falan yaghfir Allahu lahum. Muhammad, if you ask Allah's forgiveness for the hypocrite 70 times, Allah will not accept it. Does that mean if he said 71 times, Allah will accept it? No, it means Allah will never accept it. 70 is, 70 is what? It's to show that. Walidalika, when someone calls you and says, Akhi, I've been calling you a thousand times, you can't say to him, you're lying. You can't say you're lying. Because thousand is an expression for a lot. Do you, you see how we got out of that one? If you say to someone, I've been calling you a thousand times, um, I've been calling you a hundred times and you never picked up. The person can't go, wait, 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 one second, let me check how many times you call me. Only 12 times? Only 12 times? And you're lying? Fear Allah. Fear Allah. <laughs> the reality is, it's an expression of so much. Are we all together, brothers? It's an expression. No one, took, no, no one means it as that figure. Based on that ayah. And there's many wallahi knowledge that we can take from the sunnah like that brothers in our day-to-day life. One of the benefits that we take from the hadith is the permissibility of using part of something but intending the whole. Is what the scholars they say. ذِكْرُ الْبَعْضِ وَإِرَادَةُ الْكُلِّ is what you study in Balagha. What did the hadith say? That your face will be distanced from the what? 70 years of the hellfire, right? So does that mean my legs are going to be in the hellfire? And my stomach? No, the face here is a part of you, but is referring to the whole of your body, of course. Are we all together, brothers? So sometimes you might use a small portion, but you mean the whole. Why was the face mentioned? And why was it specifically mentioned? Because the day of judgment, people are going to try to protect their face from the hellfire. Allah mentioned it subhanahu wa ta'ala. يَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا تَتَقَلَّبُ فِيهِ فِيهِ الْقُلُوبُ وَالْأَبَصَارِ 
where their hearts and their eyes, the eyes is the face here. And we'll stop there inshallah ta'ala. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and Shaytan and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk.